<laughs> Bye, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, it gives me great privilege today to welcome Matt uh, along to, to come and uh, give the, the seminar today. Uh, Matt is part of a small team of natural advisors who provide guidance in relation to the protection and conservation of the environment of Scotland's national forests and land. He's particularly interested in creative archaeological visualisation, uh, and I've got an LP to prove it uh, as well. Uh, uh, he's also uh, interested in outdoor learning uh, and the practice and principles of historic asset management. Uh, <clears throat> continuing on, uh, the ecosystems approach and sustainable land management. So a whole host of different themes there uh, from Matt. Uh, he describes his role as top and tail projects, assessing cultural significance and identifying opportunities, developing and commissioning work and communicating the results to wider communities of interest. Uh, and this included quite a few recent publications, including Into the Wildwoods and The First Foresters uh, as well, uh, which I recommend uh, both going and getting those, uh, and also Dendrochronology. Uh, <clears throat> and there's also a recent interview with Matt on the Career in Ruins podcast as well to, to check out. Uh, so, uh, as Matt goes along, if you do have any questions, then please type them into the box. I will take a note of them, uh, and then uh, after Matt's presentation, I'll read them out and put them to Matt uh, as well. Uh, <clears throat> so, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Matt's talk uh, <clears throat> and present on a new set of threads, the production and design of Into the Woodlands and the First Foresters. I think everyone can see my screen now, so thank you very much for bearing with. Um, the good news is uh, that because since the release of A Song in Stone uh, uh, earlier last week, I have updated this talk uh, quite considerably and have now uh, can, can present a new set of threads, the production and design of Into the Wildwoods, The First Foresters and A Song in Stone. So uh, thank you for waiting and I'll, I'll, I'll crack on without uh, any further ado. Uh, this presentation looks behind the scenes of the production and design of these three booklets uh, published in 2020, 20, uh, 2019 and 2021 respectively. The booklets are the, re uh, the result of many different contributions and collaborations from a range of professions, uh, including foresters, ecologists, archaeologists, educators, uh, artists and photographers, all working together to present a fresh take on both the interpretation of our ancient past and our contemporary archaeological practice. Uh, the booklets are aimed at teachers, archaeological educators, uh, and anyone who is interested in a deep time approach to woodland heritage and its interpretation. Uh, the booklets present and interpret some quite complex uh, and unconventional archaeological ideas. Uh, they take a carefully tailored approach to archaeological discussion, creative indoor activities and practical outdoor learning using the threads of archaeological methodology, um, today's native woodlands and the ancient wildwood to explore the lives of Mesolithic wild harvesters who first ventured in uh, and the Neolithic pioneers who followed long after. The most recent, uh, A Song in Stone, uses an inspirational blend of objective recording, subjective analysis and narrative interpretation to encourage both critical thinking and creative arts, drawing on the work of leading archaeologists and rock art researchers to describe a time and tradition far removed from today. The booklets are both reference material and learning resource. They use a popular communication style and bold design to align an archaeological and ecological ethos with a more subtle message uh, of stewardship and responsibility. They are intended to share and shape values across a wide readership while preparing the practitioner uh, with information and ideas for their learners. So we'll be looking into the development process, highlighting common design features and thinking about lessons learned from their production from one to another. The new set of threads from the title uh, really refers to three different things. Uh, the unusual ecological approach taken in looking at the Mesolithic and the Neolithic. Uh, the work that we put into our cast of characters, both as individuals and their clothing, uh, and as a collective, clothing the resources as decoration. 
and the creative approach that we took in considering the rock art. From the outset, I wanted to create something special, blending a very archaeological overview uh, with an inspiring teaching aid packed with ideas and illustrations. I started in the Neolithic with the first foresters, reflecting the creation of Forestry and Land Scotland uh, as Scotland's newest agency back in 2019, before looking at the Mesolithic with Into the Wildwoods in 2020. And A Song in Stone has only just been published in part to celebrate the fantastic project that is Scotland's rock art project. The planning process itself is fairly flexible. Uh, by giving the same importance to both text and illustrations and gathering them both at the same time, uh, one tends to inform the other. It's a two way process and the various collaborators swap ideas and edit and refine as we go. Taking an, eco an ecosystem approach uh, to land management planning has been core to Forestry and Land Scotland's work for a while now. In short, the ecosystem approach makes sure we recognise and sustain all the benefits provided by the National Forest Estate and helps deliver a range of social, economic and environmental benefits. To support this, uh, to support this eco ecosystem approach and translate the tricky concepts of natural assets and uh, natural capital, we de developed eight natural asset planning principles, considering significant natural assets, ecosystem integrity and functioning, pressures and risks, resilience, uh, ideas of spatial patterns and connectivity, geographic scale, time scales and change, and of course, people. Uh, my role in all of this was to develop and produce the supporting guidance. And I illustrated the document with a suite of lino cut prints, specially commissioned from artist Liz Myhill. Uh, these acted to provide a common visual style across the very different principles and allowed us to design each illustration to support uh, its individual theme. I'd like to think that I brought an archaeological eye to the design, uh, particularly in terms of perspective. Uh, in this section on the left, we blended an aerial view of drained and degrading peat with a section through healthy and restored peat illustrating the, ge uh, the geographic scale of our peatland restoration program. However, the influence of Charlie Harper, the great American illustrator and naturalist, may well have played an equal role uh, seen here in this view of a tree hosting uh, a woodpecker nest and a bark beetle pattern, uh, which was used to illustrate ecosystem integrity and functioning. If you don't know Charlie Harper's work, uh, take down his name right now uh, and check it out. Uh, his work is really inspirational. Complex ideas are approached through design and perspective, uh, and he called this, this approach minimal realism. Uh, I could have picked any of his illustrations to show you, but felt that this image of piranhas stripping a cow to the bones was somehow appropriate given some of the content that we'll be getting later on. Producing the ecosystem approach uh, got me thinking about how demonstrating ideas and concepts through uh, design uh, and illustration would work and how I could make the integrated ecosystem approach work itself for archaeology, connecting our methods and practice with uh, the explanations and narratives that we're trying to uh, uh, portray. For Into the Wildwoods, we wanted to explore the interconnected ideas of habitats, of natural resources and seasonal change, and to encourage indoor and outdoor learning by thinking about the natural world as a spatial network of integrated ecosystems. We aimed to uncover an ancient past that is still accessible today in today's native woodlands, rooted in an ecological understanding of place and time and in our human response to both. We also used short personal features to highlight uh, archaeological and ecological methodology and use individual voices to highlight the various careers that are involved. And in the first foresters, we wanted to explore the interconnected ideas of Neolithic first farmers, uh, first foresters and first builders uh, and to encourage indoor and outdoor learning by thinking like a first forester. So although Into the Wildwoods is very ecological um, and the first far foresters is pretty theoretical, uh, both take this interconnected approach uh, from the ecosystem approach to engage the reader and consolidate their understanding. 
both also take a necessarily experiential route to explore their archaeology, as this is really the only way it's possible to meet the intangible of the Mesolithic or appreciate the vanished timber Neolithic. For A Song in Stone, we aimed to highlight three broad archaeological approaches to rock art investigation. Uh, objective recording, subjective analysis and narrative interpretation and emphasise that a good rock art researcher should seek to blend all three within their studies, within their writing and within their illustrations. We wanted to encourage both critical thinking and creative imagination. And strangely, although the rock art itself is the most tangible cultural heritage of the three booklets, you can, you can go and visit it, touch it, its story was perhaps the hardest to tell. However, uh, I'd like to spend a bit of time looking at the common design features uh, shared across all three booklets before reflecting on the lessons learned uh, from the development and production of one through to the other. Looking to the text, uh, we tried to deliver a popular but detailed archaeological narrative. Um, we didn't use academic re references, although there is a reading list at the end, obviously. Uh, and we do use quotes from leading archaeologists to emphasise our key ideas, uh, quotes brought out uh, from the text. We also used thematic box features uh, in between the different sections. For the first foresters, we focused on the creative development process behind our archaeological visualisations, uh, looking to the unusual woodland photographic commission I'll talk about later, and our cast of cool characters. And for Into the, Into the Wildwoods, the focus was on professional voices and their role in the research process. Uh, so we had an archaeologist and an environmental scientist, uh, and this indeed is Scott's section focusing on archaeology under the microscope. We had an archaeological reenactor, an ecologist, a landscape architect and a forester, all explaining their role in the process. And for A Song in Stone, the short features describe personal experiences or explain archaeological methodology. Uh, these features were designed to be used as short reading tasks in the classroom uh, and link to the learning suggestions at the back. Uh, which include ideas for classroom posters, for exhibitions, critical thinking tasks and creative writing, presentations uh, and creative art ideas. Highlighted keywords throughout the short features uh, emphasise some important themes, themes of different archaeological re recording techniques, such as digital documentation that you see here, uh, of land use, changing land use, of landscape uh, and of social values and heritage interpretation. In the context of archaeological learning, a song in stone is actually quite unusual uh, because it's firmly aimed at teachers and learners at the third level. Uh, that's the first two years of secondary school. Looking to the illustrations, uh, I always put a lot of effort into picking the right artists for the right task, uh, playing to their strengths. Uh, and although I always try to guide the content and the composition, uh, of the work so as best to fit it in with the wider text uh, and design. It's important to let the artist create and, and to listen to their ideas. So this example uh, demonstrates, demonstrates both the compositional guide uh, that I provided the artist and my own poor skills as an artist. Um, I asked uh, Alice Watterson, who has a, a very distinctive photorealistic style to illustrate the difference between a treasured axe head and a working axe. Alice took the brief and added her own ideas of clean hands and rough working hands and the idea of older hands passing down a treasured jadeite axe head to the next generation. And in this next example, I asked Alan Braby, who has a distinctively bold and detailed style, uh, to imagine wrapping a decaying timber circle with an earthwork hinge, holding back the dark forces. Timber circles are easy to imagine uh, as totem poles shorn of their bark like telegraph poles. But what if they were burnt and broken, upturned uh, and forced into the ground with their roots in the air? Alan loves a, a challenge uh, and loves a good narrative illustration and you can squeeze a lot of drama and detail into every picture. Uh, the effort being put by the local community into wrapping this decaying timber circle is clear, uh, as is the importance that they're putting to the task. 
In terms of formats, uh, I've always found that common parameters, uh, a design, uh, when you supply any commission or, art, uh, for, or, or commission any artwork or illustration, uh, discuss and agree the format first. Um, as you can probably tell, I like square things, square uh, publications, and I favour full page illustrations. Uh, this isn't everyone's cup of tea, uh, but it does encourage a double page screen view, um, which is really important given the links between the text and the illustrations. And in hard copy, uh, it's very distinctive. Um, it looks unusual and feels great to hold. So you've got to remember that part of the purpose of these learning resources is to impress, uh, to impress our stakeholders, but particularly actually to impress my own colleagues. Uh, in forestry, archaeology and the historic environment is usually something that just gets in the way. Um, so being able to set the Mesolithic wild harvesters very firmly in our own native woodlands helps make the connection to the deep time aspect of our own stewardship, our own day to day stewardship of the National Forest Estate. Similarly, uh, highlighting the iconic polished stone axe head and the timber monuments of the Neolithic uh, shown here uh, as an IKEA style instructions for a flat pack timber circle, if anybody fancies building one. It helps the Neolithic first forester uh, become part of the forestry and land Scotland narrative. So I want kids to look at uh, a remarkable old oak like this one grown dead straight uh, in the woods around the back of my house. And I want them to think Neolithic, uh, but I also want my colleagues to do this as well. And that's part of the purpose of these uh, um, resources. There are lots of visual links all the way through. Uh, in this example from Into the Wildwoods, uh, Pila the Trapper and Oihana the Tanner are used to illustrate the Highland Pinewoods clan, one of the five different habitats used in the booklet. The character card notes that Oihana is Pila's mother. She once surprised a boar and was charged but killed it on the end of her spear. She wears its tusk with pride and often tells the story. The boar forms one of the resource cards chosen for the Highland Pinewoods clan. You can see them in the middle. Um, and Oihana also wears the tusk at her waist. And thinking about clothing, the caption notes that we gave Oihana simple shoes, each one made of a piece of leather turned up and laced together. And we don't, though, although we don't know whether tattooing was done in the Mesolithic, it is an ancient art and she has two tattooed lines on her ankle, uh, showing the importance between illustration and caption. The boar tusk takes centre stage in this fantastic narrative visualisation by Orcadian Alex Leonard, full of drama and easily one of my favourite illustrations of all those I have ever commissioned. There is also a visual link in the compositional symmetry across the suite of narrative visualisations by Alex in Into the Wildwoods, and a subtle visual link between the landscape form of Liz My Hill's cover lino cut for the first foresters that we'll see in a bit, and Alan's Neolithic landscape populated by simple IKEA style cartoon figures. Visual links all the way through each, to all three of the booklets, in fact. Characters like Ohana are accessible and authentic. They help drive the narrative and inspire a very human connection. Winter, one of our cover stars for the first foresters, casually carries a skull and bones in her basket. Why does she have a skull in her basket, I hear you ask? Well, you have to read the booklet to find out. The characters are an integral part of the main activity in the first foresters. The narrative section, the Neolithic mind, which was written by Gavin McGregor and Ingrid Shearer. But they're also a key element of the whole design concept. Uh, as are, indeed, the lino cuts. Uh, these, the prints, uh, I recycled the cover of the first foresters from the previous ecosystem approach work. So you can see the ecosystem approach on the left hand side and the cover on the right. I had to edit out all the plantation conifers and enhance the wildwood by cutting and pasting and stamping lots more trees. The prints also provide the colour palette for the design and layout of each of the uh, three books and provide a similar series unifying service as the characters. A photograph of the lino cut prints hanging up to dry provided the frontispiece for A Song in Stone, setting the scene for the content that follows by subtly emphasising the art in rock art and the repeating grammar of the ancient abstract motifs. 
in terms of art and archaeology, I've been greatly influenced over the years by your own work uh, here at the UHI Orkney College. Artifacts, however, in the booklets tend not to get much of a look in. But I was so pleased with this composite image of polished stone axe heads on the left hand side that I wanted to include something similar for the Mesolithic in terms of microliths in Into the Wildwoods. I thought about arranging them carefully or portraying them as a big pile, but then I thought of their typology. Uh, how better to suggest their standard forms other than a repeating signature? And in terms of photography, uh, I asked John McPherson here, a professional photographer, to explore Scotland's best examples of native wildwood for the first foresters. I needed photography that captured the spirit of the native woodland and illustrated the different human habitats, uh, uh, different habitats described. I also wanted him to evoke our different human responses to woodland and the trees within it. So his brief was to take photographs that suggested woodland as open, light and safe, green, vibrant and alive, bare, skeletal and dormant, deep, dark and scary, dead, fallen and rotting, and thick, dense and impenetrable. I needed huge ancient trees, dry, standing deadwood and tiny, delicate saplings. No human activity whatsoever, I demanded. Uh, John later told me that this was the strangest commission that he'd ever received. Uh, and this, as you can see, is the incredulous face of a man successfully realising his brief. John visited northern birch woods in Ascent, the pine woods of Puchican Forest, which are seen here, the coastal oak woods of Artrillion and the coastal hazelwood of Balahorn before plunging deep into the broadleaf woodland of Jocks Gill, uh, the native woodland of a uh, broadleaf woodland in the Clyde Valley. He photographed these amazing woodland habitats at a range of scales. From close up with individual leaves and trees as the subject of habitat portraits and from afar with canopy and woodland as the sub subjects of habitat landscapes. He used light and composition to frame his subjects and tried to evoke both the natural beauty of the wildwoods and our spiritual response to it. He took the native natural themes of life and growth and of death and decay and interwove them with inferences of drama and movement, ritual and magic, and of immersion and the woodland edge. This is the wind whipping through the canopy of the drum bag uh, birchwoods in Ascent in the northwest of Scotland. After he'd completed his task, he sent me a USB stick with over 3,000 images on it. And choosing the best to publish in the first Foresters was really, really difficult. But it did mean that I was able to uh, uh, recycle the commission and use it for Into the Wildwoods too. However, I wanted to evoke a real sense of timeless wilderness. Uh, so I used an ink splatter filter at a really high resolution to create a different sense of atmosphere uh, amongst the photographs. This here uh, is our great mountain towering over the drum bag birchwoods. And you can see the great mountain taking centre stage in this Mesolithic map. Uh, and it's also one of the resource cards uh, illustrating our core activity. There are 10 common resource cards that are then used alongside the sets of six special resource cards that represent each of the five habitats. And moving from the production of the first foresters into, into the wildwoods, uh, the lessons that I learned from the first booklet. Um, the first foresters was a little complex, although arguably this is because of the, the complexity uh, of Neolithic archaeology. And into the wildwoods was simpler, uh, simpler times perhaps, and focused on habitats and seasonal resources with only one main activity, uh, mapping the Mesolithic. This activity involves lots of writing, drawing and thinking alongside a discussion of ancient life cycles and an exploration of our own. Because Mesolithic people lived mobile lives, moving to different parts of their landscape at different times of the year, responding to the seasonal availability of natural resources. They regularly moved camps and lived off both the land and sea as hunter gatherer fishers, skillfully exploiting the rich natural resources available to them. 
to help understand and imagine this Mesolithic experience in today's outdoors, we created five different group, groups or clans. And our clans are named after the woodland or habitat types and illustrate five key habitats used in the mapping the Mesolithic activity. These are Atlantic rainwoods, rainforest, uh, highland pine woods, lowland broadleaf woodlands, coastal estuaries, and coastal birch woods. Much more effort this time went into developing this one activity. And this, I think, allowed us to stitch the thread of the activity uh, much more firmly into the body of the resource. Here you have illustrator Emma Metcalf uh, hard at work on one of our Mesolithic maps. But I could equally have shown you Alex Leonard and Kim Biddulf hard at work creating each clan, or Liz Myhill hard at work in her studio printing the habitat lino cuts. We also developed a separate storyline uh, to help teachers deliver a more defined range of activities that reference and build on uh, the material in Into the Wildwoods. The storyline available online uses several key creative activities and a range of supporting discussion points to uh, contextualize cross-curricular learning using the Mesolithic period as a topic. The key creative activities include a classroom timeline to explore chronology and set the Mesolithic in context, a Mesolithic calendar to explore the seasons within the Wildwoods, a nature calendar to enable a discussion of seasons then and seasons now, an interactive Mesolithic wall freeze to explore a range of habitats and the people that lived within them, and the core Mesolithic map makers, map makers project, exploring the themes of cognitive maps, story maps, connected landscapes, seasonal resources, special places, movement and travel, and different scales. And then finally, a gathering night uh, referencing Margaret Elphinstone's fantastic book to celebrate and present learning and classwork. Another lesson learned was to have material ready to follow up the launch. Uh, in this case, a blog post and an art competition. During the first lockdown, we invited young artists to draw their own imaginary Mesolithic landscape and the various resources that could be found within it. Their prize was to be included as apprentice, apprentice Mesolithic map makers in a brand new reconstruction drawing. We had a great response and lots of fantastic entries, including paintings, drawings, and photographs of maps put together from things found in the woods, sticks and stones, even feathers and bones. And in this illustration by Alex, it's early autumn and having spent all of spring and summer trapping and hunting for furs, the Highland Pinewood clan is traveling to the coast for the hazelnut harvest before the late autumn rains. They, then they will move to trade and celebrate the harvest at the clan gathering by the sea. Pila is explaining the route they will follow down the river towards the sky of the setting sun, and her two apprentice map makers are our competition winners, Sky and Rowan. Pila's map is orientated towards the setting sun in the, sun in the west. She has laid out the river with twigs and the sea with nettle leaves, moulding the hills and mountains out of earth. Her carved animal and fish figurines are based on similar figurines found in Norway. The oak, leak, leaf, leak and, the oak leaf lake and trout figurine reflects the places and resources that were marked on Rowan's detailed map, while the charcoal doors marked on the pebbles of the camp in the foreground and the red ochre of the hearth were inspired by the bold design of Sky's map. There are more pebble tents marking the clan gathering at the coast alongside the flint blades that the Highland Pinewood clan hope to exchange for their felt and their furs. I like explaining the development process as part of the whole within the booklets, exploring the methodology uh, of illustration in the short features within the first foresters and using the character scamps or the early sketches uh, in both. I think this, this allows an insight into the process uh, and makes the characters themselves feel more accessible. Um, it also makes the creation of new characters by the learners themselves feel more uh, achievable when they see the process that, that Alex has gone through. However, I really only learned this in time for Into the Wildwoods, another lesson learned, and one that I bet is relevant for a whole host of archaeological publications. Uh, people like seeing the workings. Alex was horrified. If I'd known you were going to do this, I'd have made them better, he said. 
says I, the rough workings are great. Returning to my theme of threads, oh, I've gone too far, I'll just go back. Uh, our Mesolithic characters are very well dressed. Um, although evidence of clothing from the period is very rare, obviously, there is every reason to believe that our ancestors were able to fashion clothing that was well made, comfortable and fit for purpose out of a wide range of natural materials. In this illustration, Egle is wearing a tunic made of fish skin sewn together with seal skin leggings and boots. Alex and Kim Biddulph, who, uh, who worked on the characters and clothing throughout, had great fun discussing and refining the clothes from um, anthropological ev evidence. Uh, my only contribution at this, uh, at this time was to insist that they all wore caper Kaylee feathers, uh, simply to annoy my colleagues in conservation. Reflecting on the production process from Into the Wildwoods to A Song in Stone, um, there were pre some pretty major differences. It was clear from the outset that characters were simply not going to play as big a role in A Song in Stone. Uh, we do have characters, our rock art artists, Pix and Derm, and our archaeologists, uh, Jasmine and Ronnie, uh, but they do play second fiddle, really, to the photography and the digital documentation and to different creative elements this time, such as this fantastic poem uh, by Lindsay McGregor. We also try to make much more of the archaeological narrative uh, within the creative visualizations. Um, because in order to prepare a visualization with an archaeological narrative, the archaeologist and the artist must work together to balance factual understanding um, and creative engagement. The factual element is educational and informative and uses archaeological information like a, a measured survey and methodology uh, to lead to an understanding of, of how we do and how we know what we think we know. While the creative element is inspirational and imaginative and uses narrative and drama to lead to uh, appreciation and, and empathy. This visualization by Alan Braby is of the table-like cup and ring mark boulder of Alt, Alt Achoy Charenich on the slopes of Ben Laws uh, above Loch Tay. The boulder and its rock art are faithful to the site, site itself and the accurate archaeological measured survey that you can uh, drawing that you see on the, the left. But we imagine the site as a table of bones uh, and depict the process of excarnation, suggesting that rock art sites may have been places where the corpses of the dead were left exposed in the open long enough for the flesh to be picked off by scavengers or lost to decay. Uh, no evidence, but it's a possibility. It's one of the ideas we, we explore within the narratives. And finally, uh, we have artist Lizzie Robertson, who was tasked with illustrating the theme of sound and vision uh, and to explore the effect of different lighting conditions on rock art in particular. Uh, moving clockwise from the top left, uh, we have uh, a moonlit scene at Achnebrek, full of drama. The panel shimmers with quartz dust under a meteor shower in the night sky above. Then we have the reconstruction uh, of archaeologist Ludovic McClellan McMahon's inventive interpretation of the Cochno Stone in 1937, which positively hums and crackles with electric eccentricity. Then moving on, her detailed portrait of Ormeg is noisy. Uh, the air is full of the rhythmic sounds of pecking. And her firelit scene uh, at the panel of Balach Mile um, it's full of flickering light and shadows, warmth and music. Uh, the rock art appears as animated symbols dancing across the panel. But in all four uh, illustrations, Lizzie has stayed faithful to the rock art itself, using photographs and visualizations resulting from digital doc documentation techniques to depict the symbols as they were originally created uh, and subsequently recorded. So summing up, um, both Into the Wildwoods and the First Foresters celebrate the importance of outdoor and archaeological learning and reward interested practitioners with accessible background information, unconventional ideas and exceptional artwork and design. 
a song in stone, celebrate Scotland's internationally significant outdoor gallery of Atlantic rock art and the shared cultural tra tradition that it represents. The aim of all three booklets is to enable the discovery and investigation of an ancient past that is still accessible today, rooted in an archaeological and ecological understanding of place and time and in our human response to both. Because these aren't just any learning resources, these are archaeological learning resources. They are detailed, creative, informative and imaginative and all available online for free. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thanks, Matt. <coughs> uh, excellent improvement. The books, all three of them are excellent. They're really good resources. Uh, <coughs> they work at every level as well. So, you know, uh, <laughs> don't be scared to think that they're just for kids. They're not. They're, they're really good. Uh, We'll open it up for some questions then. If anyone's got a question, then please do uh, enter it into the chat now. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck with me asking a series of questions uh, <laughs> to Matt uh, over the next uh, wee while. I can see there's one question uh, already uh, up in the chat. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> a member of the audience is asking if you know, uh, apart from Seahenge, are there any other examples of trees being buried uh, upside down? I don't know. I can't think of any off head, but it was certainly Seahenge that inspired the whole uh, idea of um, uh, thinking about how they treated timber uh, in the Neolithic. Um, I, I do. I do think that sometimes the the reconstruction drawings that we see are, are very sterile, almost. Uh, they are. They are uh, telegraph poles, um, whereas they could have been uh, richly decorated. They could have been uh, 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 burnt and broken. Uh, could have just been, you know, left unbrashed with with bracken and, and twigs, or indeed uh, shoved upside down with the with the roots in the air. Um, I think there is evidence that uh, things like cursus monuments started to be um, destroyed during their construction as 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 the the community moved from one end to the other so uh, it's it's i think it was it was just it's about thinking about neolithic timber in in as wide a range of of ways as possible yeah that's, i can't think of any other examples but i'm, I'm remembering that i think it was is it uh, <clears throat> Kenny Brophy and, and Gordon Noble had a, a timber circle where they thought part of it was uh, a living tree? I think they found uh, evidence of root bowl amongst the, 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 the post settings, suggesting that it could have incorporated living trees as well as, as you're saying, you know, uh, these other things. Uh, <clears throat> that brings me actually onto a question that I was going to ask you, uh, which is how do you think the role of archaeological illustrations have changed now? I mean, this the books uh, and the illustrations within them bring everything to life so much more and and it's also you know you've, you've you've caught not just you know the the kind of sort of standard illustrations if you go to an archaeological site you always see you know sort of men working and then you know a lady comes along with some sandwiches uh, or something in a basket but you've got you know the whole family groups and you you know you're bringing in sort of members of society you know thinking of children etc uh, that aren't usually captured in archaeological illustrations so do you think the, the kind of role of illustration to inform an archaeology has changed quite considerably? Um, I think the, the potential has changed. Um, I think that people are thinking a lot more about how the re what the reconstruction is is doing and what kind of uh, um, message it's giving. Um, I think that the, the role has changed largely because of the it's not just about an interpretation panel at a site anymore. I think that was why why these three books are quite unusual because we did put a lot of resource into into the illustrations behind them, um, and uh, it's it's not just a um, which gives you, which frees you up to do a lot of different things. Um, the I have sworn to myself. I mean, I do do a fair a fair amount of interpretation panel uh, with with the work on the National Forest Estate, and I'm never going to do another cutaway where you see, for example, um, half a brock standing in the landscape, but you're actually seeing into the brock as well, because while uh, that is useful. That's a separate illustration. I think that you know the the the, the brock in the landscape is is one illustration. Uh, the the interior is another, um, and and the cutaway, I think uh, it just it, it muddies the water sometimes. Um, and uh, so I'm 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 a big fan of, I guess simplicity, but also e experimentation and um, uh, uh, really pushing the envelope. I think with 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 visualizations like this. 
Cool. And there's been a couple of uh, <clears throat> questions that kind of tally on to that. So uh, in terms of the resources, obviously they've put together for these books. Uh, Sue asks if uh, any of the materials available as an app that you might be able to access when kind of walking around <laughs> woodlands and landscapes. Uh, and uh, Hannah asks if any of this might be put into an, <clears throat> an animation or, or that kind of resource as well. Um, I, I haven't done either of those two excellent suggestions. Uh, one, uh, because I think uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure that an app would stand, the amount of resource that would go into it, would, would it stand the test of time? Um, uh, it's, it's something to, to think about, um, but uh, the, 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 the aim, I guess the target audience here are the, is the practitioner to, to, a, to, to give them the ideas uh, and the, the material, the ammunition to take that to their learners. Um, the uh, uh, I'd I'd love to do an animation. I know um, Alex Leonard is very keen on 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 taking uh, particularly things like the the information from the Nessa Brodka um, into an animation. Again, it's 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 about the resources, about the time that you know. Uh, um, we simply don't have the money to do that, and I'd I'd love to, but uh, alas, no. Yeah, it's certainly very time consuming to make <laughs> to make that kind of resource, and uh, and it's a, a long time putting those animations together. Uh, as well, uh, exploring uh, the kind of animations uh, and, and the books themselves. Uh, we've got a question from Sally asking if you considered putting, uh, including lots of colour on the clothing as, as well, given the sort of painting and art coming out of uh, some of our uh, sites, such as the Nessa Brodka now with technically <laughs> painted stones uh, and that kind of thing. What do you think to the use of colour? Well, uh, our two uh, um, rock artists in A Song of Stone, uh, are have have elements of that. Um, we were very. I, I love the the stone dust that you can see on Derm's leather apron, um, resulting from him uh, pecking and carving all day. Um, and I was less less sure about um, having picks uh, with uh, you know splattered with paint and uh, with paintbrushes and, and and paint pots because it really does suggest that. Art, uh was was originally painted, and we don't really have the um, the evidence for that. Um, but we don't have the evidence that it wasn't, or at least maybe it was partially. And it, and I just felt it would be uh, there would be questions from the kids uh, w w that that would be difficult to to answer if they were to say, well, what, you know, w w where where's the color in rock art? Uh, and we were to say, well, we don't know, so we're not going to have any. Um, I think we have to say we don't know, but let's try. Let's have let's experiment. Let let's see what it looks like. So, uh, in both uh, in both De Pix and Dermar are are Neolithic rock artists. They have uh, very definite color. Um, I think I'm quite pleased with the 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 color within the Neolithic as well. Uh, sorry, within the Mesolithic. The, I think our our characters are are dressed to the nines. That's partly where the, the, the idea of the title came from, the new set of threads. I think the work that Kim and Alex did on the um, the, the Mesolithic wardrobe was was fantastic. Uh, and, and it is it is colourful and adventurous and, it, and it, it's it's all there. And I think uh, sadly that our Neolithic guys are maybe a little bit dull in comparison, but then uh, maybe the uh, the Neolithic, Neolithic life was perhaps a little bit dull in comparison to a, a, a <laughs> Mesolithic, uh, unless you, you're thinking about their, their crazy uh, monuments. Yeah, I suppose, you know, the, you get quite a lot of freedom, don't you, with this kind of work to explore a lot of these things that maybe, I don't know, people may be reluctant to explore in other mediums, but, you know, uh, looking at it like this, you, you get to go down to some interesting narratives and and put up some some concepts but because of the visualization of it as well it's it's quite easy to engage with so yes. you, know, you look at it and you think actually, well actually you can kind of you kind of see this working you know there's no reason uh why it shouldn't uh someone's also asked uh, away from kind of uh color scapes uh, about soundscapes uh and uh whether uh the soundscape of, of the woodland or the soundscape of the uh, stone set, uh, sorry, the, the timber settings was something that was sort of taken into consideration as well uh, as part of the work. Whether you, you were considering soundscapes? Uh, uh, I'll be honest and say that the it didn't cross my mind for the first two. Um, it very much did in terms of the, the, the pecking uh, and that 
really stemmed from uh, Hugo Anderson Weimark's description of his exp uh, experimental recarving of a, of a cut mark. Uh, there's, there's a quote um, taken from uh, an animate landscape that we included within A Song in Stone. It's a quote from Hugo. It's, it's really, really evocative in terms of sound and uh, sweat and toil for, for in terms of car carving a rock art. Um, but the in town so and and I'm really pleased with the with the Ormaic picture from Lizzie where we have the almost the, the sort of sound bar from a from a hi-fi floating in the air above uh the 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 rock art itself you know as suggesting that sound and, and music was as as important um but again we don't really know uh, and in terms of uh taking taking the, the project a, a stage further, um, it's a really good idea. I will take that away and think about it. Um, I recently heard uh, a field recording uh, a friend of mine had done inside the uh, Duncarloway, a uh, Brock on Lewis, uh, where a really high wind was whipping up the uh, the scaffolding that's surrounding the Brock. Brock it's, it's currently undergoing conservation works. Um, and uh, he used some incredible microphones uh, and caught a really unusual sound ver reverberation within the broch, uh, and it really brought the, his place and time to life uh, listening to that. Um, and uh, I, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of scope for 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 commissioning that sort of experiential um, uh, field recordings with, within archaeology. Yeah, and I think you know, soundscapes really do bring bring stuff to life. I was sort of think about the mesolithic woodland and, and what that would have been like to kind of experience audially because you know you think about not only the the, the different kind of trees that are there but also you know you've got wolves knocking about <laughs> you've got you know what do aurochs sound like you know that'd be pretty amazing you've got elk and things like that bears knocking about uh, as well so it's great to kind of think about that uh, as well and obviously this has been uh, a resource that's gone into schools uh, and I like the combination, obviously, of archaeology and uh, the woodlands. Uh, and I was wondering if you've got any thoughts about, you know, uh, the importance of, of teaching kids not only about archaeology, but about landscape and, and about trees. You know, there's not a lot of kids these days that can actually recognise one tree uh, from another. And, and whether you've had uh, any feedback uh, from schools or, or students uh, on, on the resources you've developed. Um I leave tree identification and uh, contemporary forestry, I guess, uh, contemporary ecology very much to my colleagues within Forestry and Land Scotland's education department um, uh, and Scottish forestry and the likes, um, where the, there is lots out there to help kids um, thinking about tree identification, tree me measuring, one of the things we use in, in, in uh, um, uh, the first foresters. Um, so. Um, and I think I, I have offered services to my ecological colleagues within the wider national environment team, um, because I think that while uh, na 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 the natural world is fairly well dealt with, I'm not sure ecology is in terms of methodology in the same way that uh, archaeology hasn't been. I mean, there, there are lots of learning resources out there about, uh, you know, life in a castle or um, uh, you know, medieval life, life in a medieval town, etc. But it's, there's not so much where they, they go into the, the, the methodology of how we know this stuff, which I hope is does run through the three booklets. It's very much about um, the practice of archaeology uh, as much as it is about the experience of outdoor learning and about the, the, the narrative of the deep past. Um, so I think that's, that. Uh, uh, yes, there's there's scope for ecology ecological learning um and i and, and uh, i have offered that to my colleagues in terms of uh the national curriculum i saw a question there um what we're trying to do very much is uh talk about cross-curricular learning so particularly in a song in stone where we're looking at uh, the geography te teacher taking something from this the um the english teacher the art teacher and and and, and a much wider uh project uh evolving um, out of the material that we, we put in front of the teachers. Um, that's going to be a very much a slow burn. It's going to be very much a, um, collaboration between them. And in that, in that sense, these are unconventional learning resources because I try not to be too uh, prescriptive about what a teacher can, should do uh, because I feel that that's their job. They're their kids, that's their classroom. Um, it's not my role to tell them how to do it, but it is uh, my role to help 
uh, with the background information, with the stunning ideas, making it all freely available online so they can rip the pictures out and put them on the classroom whiteboards. It's it's the materials there and there are suggestions and ideas there, but they're not prescriptive, which does set them a little bit aside. Uh, in terms of uh, evaluation, uh, again, it's really difficult and try, trying to get the uh, even the promotion of this sort of well, let's face it, quite left of centre, uh, oddball resource uh, in front of the, your majority of teachers is is difficult. Um, so, but like like uh, Wolf Brothers Wildwoods, which was a resource we did in 2011, uh, which is very firmly on the back of Michelle Paver's amazing set of booklets of books for kids, uh, the Wolf Brothers series, which are uh, a, a, an excellent, excellent read. Um, I was very much uh, the Wolf Brothers Wildwoods was was very much a, a slow burning resource, but we've had loads of really good comments and feedback uh, over the last 10 years, um, which is not us going out to get to evaluate to get to get response back. Um, it's very much uh, um, anecdotal, um, but it is a slow burn and people are people have picked it up and are using it alongside reading uh, Wolf Brother in the classroom. And I think these three booklets and put and I think I mean, going back to almost the purpose of the, the the talk, looking at the production of them, I think that having them so clearly a part of a series is going to help because the teacher that picks up one or a, or a reader that picks up one is it will easily find the others, um, and and that that I think uh, they they all start to support each other, uh, which is uh, obviously for the best rather than just a, a, a series of one offs that, uh, that that don't do that. So um, that unifying design. Um, is also uh, helps, I think, that that um, promotional angle. Yeah, and you, you can see, you know, that they're linked just by looking at them. You know, absolutely. That, that, you know, it's it's, it's <clears throat> great on the eye. I think we've got time for for one last question. So I'm just going to go to Sue's question, and that is, what's next, Matt? I have, oh, I haven't decided yet. Um, uh, uh, the the Scottish Cranock Centre is. Um, Moving across the the loch, uh, the Scottish Cranock Centre is a trailblazer of uh, a pioneer of uh, um, both outdoor learning and uh, ancient experiential uh, outdoor lear uh, archaeological learning. Um, and I'd love to help them when they set up with their new um, the new series of crowds they're going to be they're planning to build. So uh, I, you know I, I've got that in the back of my mind. Waterlogged wood um, and uh, Iron Age technologies, I guess, um, but uh, yeah, we'll wait. We'll wait and see. That maybe maybe Brock's actually uh, thinking Keithness Brock, Brock project, and it, it's it's always good to have a partner, um, and certainly for um, the a Song in Stone has really benefited and and, and promotionally will benefit, but also um, in terms of the 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 intellectual uh, work that the the guys from uh, the the scrap team from HES, um, the uh, Kilmartin Museum put in. It's it's been really it's really good to collaborate. I think that that's a that's a nice way to to, to end almost. It's uh, it's good to share, um, and uh, when I've got the, the the time and the resource and the, the the backing to put this sort of thing together, um, I like being able to uh, to just share that 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 uh, that around. No, and I think the the collaboration Vikings. Important. I'd very <laughs> much like to do Vikings. Vikings, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Braggy smiling, ready. Uh, yeah, no, and I think the collaborations it really enriches all of those books as well, and you know it just shows that. Yeah, there's quite a lot of people doing different themes, but you can bring them all together to tell a, a really strong narrative about something as well, which is which is fantastic to see. Which and, and in particular, pick up a song in stone and look look at how the uh, the personal features uh, build on each other to tell the tale. The, it, almost, the the text of the book is almost incidental. The story of uh, of rock art it is is it weaves between the 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 the, the main thing or the or the the, the, the seven individual features that, that tell the story of the archaeological methodologies. Excellent. Well, I think I think that's us. <laughs> yeah, I've upgraded some more people to panelists as we went along. Um, does anybody in the panel want to say anything to Matt before we finish? Everybody's very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people saying thank you very much in the chat. Well, four, four o'clock on a Friday is, is a pressure slot. You've got to be entertaining, I felt, and uh, I, I hope I have been. Most definitely, I'd say, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, should we say thank you very much to Matt then? We'll all be giving him a round of applause again, no doubt. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um,